If you've been following my work for any length of time, chances are you're familiar with the Nahani Valley, a mysterious region in northwestern Canada, saturated with more strange legends and forgotten folklore than just about any other place in the Great White North. In the spring of 2018, I published a book on these stories entitled Legends of the Nahani Valley. Later that fall, I published what would become my most popular YouTube video, entitled Interview with the Cryptid Hunter in which I interviewed an American adventurer named Frank Graves, whose 1965 expedition to the Nahani Valley formed the foundation upon which some of the region's most fascinating legends are based. One of the legends which Mr. Graves' expedition brought to public awareness is the story of the Wahila, a giant, strange-looking, solitary white wolf said to roam the boreal forests of northern Canada and Alaska. Suspected of being everything from a prehistoric remnant to a ghost wolf, this rare and mysterious canine has appeared in the reports of trappers, prospectors, and Indians from the mid-20th century to the present day. The following is the story of the Wahila as described in my book Legends of the Nahani Valley, shorn of a number of subchapters, the comprehensibility of which requires more backstory than I'm prepared to include in this video. Despite these omissions, this video still contains some references to frontiersmen and biologists with which the casual viewer may be unfamiliar. Although you can absolutely understand and enjoy this video in its entirety without any knowledge of these characters, any viewers interested in putting them into context can of course do so by reading my book Legends of the Nahani Valley, which you can find by clicking the link in the description. Without further ado, here is the story of the Wahila. Enjoy. During his trip to the Nahani Valley in the summer of 1965, Frank Graves spent a good deal of time fraternizing with the sourdoughs of Nahani Butte. When they finally decided that he was neither crazy nor a government agent, the locals warmed up to him and began to tell him amusing stories of unfortunate greenhorns who ventured up the South Nahani without a lick of backcountry experience, only to come crawling back to Nahani Butte, quote, plain scared of the world up that river. At first, wrote Graves in his first letter to Ivan Sanderson, I took the stories of the old-timers about these scared trappers and prospectors as being nothing much more than the sort of snide accounts that permanent residents of far out-of-the-way places relate about the behavior of outsiders. But this attitude of mine seems to have gotten under the skins of the locals, and the resident Amerinds, and even those other Indians who wander in from the outlands from time to time. It then dawned on me that I was giving offense by not believing what they told me, so I sort of indicated that I did want to believe what they said, but that I thought they had just been pulling my leg as a greenhorn from the outside. That did it. The locals proceeded to take Graves on a tour of the lower part of the South Nahani, showing him burned out cabins, old rusted rifles, and other relics abandoned by woodsmen who lost their taste for this foreboding stretch of Mackenzie country. Eventually, one of Graves' new acquaintances, a local Dene hunter, agreed to take the young mechanic above Virginia Falls where he could find unique subarctic vegetation to add to his botanical collection. As was mentioned in the previous chapter, during one such outing, Frank and his guide stumbled upon three 16-inch long human-like footprints in the mud of some unlucky veil, perhaps signs of the elusive Nakani. Several days later, Graves went out in the bush again with his Dene friend, who had brought his dog along with them in case they came across some game that needed flushing out. The trio worked their way up a glen, which led from the river, and onto a small plateau covered with grass and brush. Sure enough, Graves' native companion spotted some wild fowl in the timber below, and, with his dog by his side, ambled down the slope towards them, hoping to bag something for supper. Graves, who was armed with a double-barreled 12-gauge shotgun loaded with birdshot, opted to stay up on the plateau in case any game appeared in that area in his partner's absence. This Indian was a pretty good tracker, wrote Graves of his Dene companion, and moved without making a sound. But his dog was not a hunter. So when I heard a noise and saw some brush moving about at the edge of the trees, I thought it was the dog coming back, and I did not raise my gun. But then an enormous white thing, that at first I thought must be a polar bear, just sort of wandered out of the trees. It wasn't a bear. It looked more like a gigantic dog. It stood straight up on rather long legs, more like a dog or a wolf. I had seen plenty of wolves, and some of them are enormous enough up there. But this thing was 20 times the size of any wolf I had ever heard of. 
By a sort of reflex action, I fired at it, and it was less than 20 paces away and only partly screened by little bushes. I hit it with two barrels of ball shot. It didn't even jump, but turned away from me and just walked back into the forest. I reloaded and fired again, and I know I hit it in the rear, but it just kept on walking. Shortly afterwards, my Indian friend bobbed up, asking what I had got. I didn't know what to say for a bit, but when I told him, we did another of our famous disappearing acts, and this time we loaded the boats and pushed off upriver, real fast. In an article entitled The Dire Wolf, published posthumously in the October 1974 issue of the magazine Pursuit, Ivan Sanderson revealed a number of interesting details about this incident which Graves did not include in his letter. Presumably in a face-to-face -face interview, or perhaps in another letter, Graves told Sanderson that the beast he encountered stood about 3 foot 6 inches at the shoulder, had a very wide head, and wore a coat of, quote, very long, rather shaggy white fur. Sanderson also revealed that, following the incident, Graves' Indian companion, quote, loosened up a bit and told him that they had met an animal that is not a wolf, unquote, but rather a mysterious creature which may have been responsible for the deaths of Willie and Frank McLeod, Martin Jorgensen, and other headless victims of the Nahani Valley. The Dene said that these beasts, quote, were much larger than any wolf, were loners, avoided real wolves, had smaller ears and much wider heads, and rather short legs with splayed feet. Their tails were very thick, and more like those of otters, while they were scavengers rather than predaceous animals. Frank's companion also told him that these beasts were quite rare, and that most of them lived further to the north, in the tundra. Some of them made annual trips to the Mackenzie Mountains and the Yukon Taiga, and a few of them stayed in the Nahani all year round. The name that Sanderson gave these cryptids, for reasons which we will explore later on in this chapter, was Wahila. Interestingly, the existence of these mysterious animals was verified in a letter written to Ivan Sanderson on July 12, 1971, by a man whose signature this author was unable to decipher. The man claimed that, in October 1970, while visiting the town of Moosonee in northern Ontario, he met an old Indian named Gugo Nanenesh, or simply Gugo, as the man refers to him later on in the letter, quote, who claimed to have come from the Nahani area, unquote. The Dene people were terrified of these monsters, Gugu maintained, claiming that they were impossible to kill. Regarding their appearance, the Indian pointed to a huge mongrel that was running round nearby, which the writer described as, quote, husky slash Alsatian crossbreed, but with the rear of a Saint Bernard, unquote, and said that the monster looked similar to that dog but much larger. When the writer inquired as to exactly how large the wild dog creature was, the Indian indicated that it had an 11-foot-long body, a 4-foot-long tail, and stood as tall as his shoulder. The rear portion of the body apparently slopes away in the manner of a bear, the writer wrote. The head appears to be low-slung and flattened, and having a broad muzzle. Colors range from brown to white. Its habits are disgusting if it exists, the letter writer continued. Part carrion eater, it can take a bear apart, but prefers to live on injured or young animals. Its delight is to snatch the young from the mother whilst she is in the process of giving birth. Also said to attack man on sight. Almost invincible, he has but one enemy. Now hang on to your hat. That enemy is... Following the publication of Sanderson's article in 1974, cryptozoologists and Fortean enthusiasts from all over North America began to speculate as to the nature of this mysterious monster, which had appeared to Frank Graves in the summer of 1965. Some thought that it might be a new species, or perhaps a survivor from the last Ice Age, while others suggested that it might be some sort of supernatural entity. Sanderson himself, in the aforementioned article, disclosed that one of Graves' first thoughts upon seeing the creature was that it was, quote, the granddaddy of all wolves. In other words, a freakishly large timber wolf. Considering a number of sightings reported by Nahani frontiersmen, this sentiment is not at all unreasonable. Over the years, more than a few lupin behemoths have appeared in the Nahani Valley. Nearly every woodsman to comment on the wolves of the Nahani area has made some remark on the incredible size that many of them managed to attain. One of the first to put such sentiments to paper was Raymond Patterson, who, in his journal, made several references to the enormity of various wolf tracks he came across over the course of his Nahani adventures. 
One of these was so large that he could fit his fist into it with room to spare, while another, measuring about six inches in diameter, he likened to a pony's foot. Patterson also described coming across, quote, a huge timber wolf, a great beast, looking much like the color of an Airedale through the falling snow, unquote, and noted on November 14, 1928, that his partner, Gordon Matthews, saw, quote, two timber wolves about the size of calves, unquote, down by the river. That same year, Captain Harry Doc Oakes flew Charlie McLeod and the men of the ill-fated name expedition into Landing Lake in Upper Flat River country. Also associated with Northern Aerial Mineral Explorations Limited were pilots R.D. Adams and W.J. Jack McDonough. On February 10, 1974, a full eight months before the publication of Sanderson's Direwolf article, the Toronto Star ran with a story in which McDonough claimed that Charlie McLeod and his crew, during their prospecting misadventure in 1928, saw wolves that were, quote, almost as big as ponies. Another frontiersman to encounter lupine colossi in the Nahani country was Gus Krauss, who claimed to have bagged a 155-pound wolf not far from his cabin. Krauss was one-upped by trapper Arthur George, who shot a 160-pound wolf in the Nahani Valley in 1929. To give these measurements some context, male Mackenzie Valley wolves, the larger gender of the largest subspecies of Canis lupus, that is, grey or timber wolves in the world, have an average weight of 113 pounds. The largest wolf ever officially recorded, killed by trapper Frank Glasser on Alaska's 70 Mile River in the summer of 1939, weighed 175 pounds. In The Dire Wolf, Ivan Sanderson mentioned that an old friend of his, a professional cameraman turned film director named Tex Zegler, quote, made a few points about what he called the Great White Wolf of Alaska, unquote, back in the 1950s, long before Frank Graves' encounter. Before he became involved in the film industry, Zegler worked as a prospector, then as a trader, and finally as a pilot in the Alaskan wilderness, earning himself the epithet the Flying Trader. During his days in the North Country, he came across gigantic, solitary white wolves on a number of occasions. According to Sanderson, Zegler expressed the opinion, quote, that these huge loners were just that, i.e. huge old wolves that lived alone, unquote. Similarly, in a letter to the editor published in Volume 2, Number 1 of the online Fortean magazine North American by Fortean Review, a man who identified himself as Paul W. and who worked in the outdoors industry described an enormous white wolf which his good friend encountered in the wilderness of northern Ontario, not far from his hunting lodge. He estimated that this animal, which was feasting on a moose carcass at the time, weighed at least 200 pounds. He said that it appeared to have a larger and broader than normal head, Paul stated, and that the front legs were quite long compared to the rear legs. As he put it, quote, It just looked real different than any wolf I have seen before. Much larger and more robust than even a big male should be, unquote. Paul added that he had personally seen and taken photographs of 8-inch wide wolf tracks in these same forests. Normal wolf tracks in the area, he maintained, have a diameter of around 4 or 5 inches. In addition to being extremely large, the wolves of Nahani country also tend to be unusually aggressive. Although wolves typically avoid humans and very rarely harm them, a startling number of wolf attacks have taken place in the Nahani Valley over the years. One of these occurred sometime in the late 1930s. The victim in this case was none other than Albert Faley. One day in late September, while out hunting moose in the woods above Virginia Falls, Albert Faley heard an unusual sound, which he described as something between a growl, a bark, and a howl. He recognized this as a call which wolves make to each other when they want to indicate potential prey. Slowly, this call was taken up by about a dozen other wolves, rising in volume until it reached a chilling, blood-curdling cacophony. Apparently, the pack was all in agreement. Suddenly, there was dead silence. Faley knew that the wolves had found their dinner and were going in for the kill. Thinking that they had caught the scent of a moose, which he might be able to intercept, he headed in the direction from which the sounds had come. After hiking for some time, Faley stopped to listen. The forest was quieter than he had expected. Instead of a frantic flurry of hoofbeats and the crackling of broken sticks, all he could hear was the distant roar of Virginia Falls. All of a sudden, a new sound arose from the woods, a chorus of soft, high-pitched whines akin to the mewing of kittens. It seemed to come from all around him. 
when he noticed ghostly gray shadows gliding through the willows out of the corner of his eye, Faley began to realize that he was the one the wolves had singled out for the kill. The hunter had become the hunted. The frontiersman readied his rifle and prepared for the inevitable. Sure enough, a big, grizzled alpha male emerged from the brush and came bounding towards him, loping silently through the snow. Faley felled the beast with a single shot. After firing additional pot shots at the rest of his unseen assailants, hidden as they were in the woods that surrounded him, he quickly retraced his steps to his boat and paddled downriver, denying those fleet-footed monsters of the Mackenzie their latest meal. Another Nahani frontiersman to narrowly avoid becoming lupine lunch was Gus Kraus. In the winter of 1935, a pack of about 20 wolves chased him up a tree at the edge of Macmillan Lake. Later on, in May 1942, Stan Turner, the brother of Dick Turner, was similarly chased up a birch tree by four slavering black timber wolves whom, he believed, had mistaken him for a caribou. And in March 1948, a trapper named Edwin Lindbergh was stalked by four shaggy degahi, as the Dene called them, while setting a beaver trap not far from the Liard River. Fortunately, he managed to drive the animals away with fire and buckshot. One of the most interesting wolf attacks to occur in the Nahani Valley, especially in the context of the Wahila, took place sometime in the early 1940s. In this story, Gus and Mary Krause decided to head up Clausen Creek to hunt for beaver. On the creek bank, at a site located a mere mile and a half from their cabin, they were attacked by two enormous white wolves, who were apparently attracted by the scent of fresh blood. At that time, Gus Kraus was a habitual pipe smoker, and Mary hated the smell of his tobacco. Whenever the two of them set out into the wilderness together, Gus took the lead, usually with a pipe in his mouth. In order to avoid the smoke, Mary trailed far behind him, keeping a distance of up to 50 feet, often grumbling darkly about her husband's odoriferous habit as she trudged along in her moccasins. That day, when they arrived at a natural mineral lick off Clausen Creek, where moose and caribou often came to taste the salt, Gus heard Mary's familiar muttering some distance behind him. Assuming that his smoking was the cause of her yammering, as he put it, he paid her no heed and carried on daydreaming. When he finally detected an edge of frantic urgency in his wife's tone, he looked up, and there on the side of the game trail, no more than five feet away from him, was a black bear. That's what she was yapping about, Gus explained in an interview. The bear, who appeared to be just as startled to see Gus as the trapper was to see him, snorted in surprise and started to amble away. Shoot him, Mary urged, hoping to use the bear as dog feed. Gus refused. They were after beaver, after all, and the trapper was in no mood to spend his morning butchering a bear just for dog feed. Mary, however, was adamant. After arguing with her for some time, the trapper finally acceded to his wife's wishes and fired at the animal, which was now about 25 feet away. He killed it with a single shot. The couple proceeded to skin the bear and dress its fat and meat for packing. By the time they had finished processing as much of the animal as they could carry back with them, they were covered in blood. Gus and Mary continued up Clausen Creek for about 300 yards until they reached the mouth of a small tributary. They decided to wash the blood off there and maybe have a cup of tea when they were finished. That done, they could finally scout for some beaver. Gus placed his rifle in the grass beside him and set about making a fire at the base of a steep cut bank, which he hoped would shield his kindling from a strong south wind that had picked up. I just set my rifle down alongside me, he said in the interview, and set raking up a little bit of grass, you know, to get the fire started. And all of a sudden, Mary said, Oh, look at the sheep. Well, I know there's no sheep down there that low, so I put my hand down on the rifle and boy oh boy, two wolves, two white wolves, white as can be. They made big jumps, about seven feet to a jump, one behind the other. They're just a jumping to beat the band. It was clear that the wolves, both of which were enormous, were heading straight for them, apparently having caught the scent of the bear's blood on the wind. Gus aimed his rifle and pulled the trigger, just as the first wolf leapt over the riverbank. The animal dropped dead a mere meter from Mary's feet. If I hadn't fired, Gus said, they'd have had her. The second wolf wheeled around, startled by the report of the rifle. Gus fired at him and missed. The animal quickly recovered its senses and moved to bound across the creek towards Mary. Just as he was jumping across the creek, said Gus, I got him right through, and he dropped in the creek. 
Many have suggested that the monster that Frank Graves came across in 1965 was nothing more than an unusually large wolf, of which the Nahani Valley has certainly seen its fair share. Perhaps, some say, it was a genetic freak, shunned by the pack for its gigantism. However, there are a few details in Graves' description of the creature which indicate that it may have been another animal entirely. Graves described the Wahila as having a very wide head, evoking images of grizzly and black bears, the Nahani Valley's only ursine residents. The heads of Mackenzie Valley wolves, on the other hand, are comparatively sleek and slender. Graves' creature also had small ears, another characteristic more commonly ascribed to the ursine than the lupine. And finally, the Wahila was estimated to stand about 3 foot 6 inches at the shoulder. The average Mackenzie wolf, in comparison, has a shoulder height of between 2 foot 8 inches and 3 foot 4 inches, while black bear's shoulders typically sit somewhere between 2 feet to 3 foot 5 inches from the ground. These attributes suggest that the Wahila that Frank Graves ran into may have been an albino black bear, perhaps something similar to the starving white medicine bear which Philip Godsell encountered in northern Manitoba in the spring of 1907. Graves, however, was adamant that what he saw was neither a bear nor a wolf, but rather something which exhibited characteristics of both. Ivan Sanderson had his own theory regarding the nature of the Wahila. In The Dire Wolf, he observed that Graves' description of the animal, coupled with the descriptions given by his Dene acquaintances, who claimed to be familiar with them, corresponded with chilling accuracy to that of a mammal believed to have gone extinct several million years ago, an ancient scavenger known colloquially as the Bear Dog. Bears, dogs, and raccoons appear to have a common ancestry, Sanderson explained, but along the line, a group of animals that are popularly called bear dogs, the Amphicyonidae, or dogs of doubtful origin, flourished all around the northern hemisphere. These were neither dogs nor bears, but a number of them were the size of the largest living bears, and some had dog-like features. Some of these huge creatures are known to have lived on until the end of what is called the Pliocene period and were thus contemporary with some animals that still live, like the muskox and bison, and could have well survived into the age of man, called the Pleistocene, and even into the post-glacial period on this continent. Sanderson went on to explain that the Amphicyonidae family was comprised of a number of genera, the most interesting of which, in the context of the Wahila, was the genus Amphicyon, meaning ambiguous dog-like creature, for which the broader family was named. Sanderson's particular interest in the Amphicyon genus stemmed from the fact that several of its species were known to have survived in North America, quote, until at least the end of the Pliocene period, unquote, which meant that relict populations of these creatures could potentially still exist in remote corners of the continent like the Nahani Valley. As of 2018, there are nine species of Amphicyon officially recognized by the scientific community, four of which are known to have lived in North America. Paleontologists have unearthed fossils of these creatures in Nebraska, Colorado, Oregon, California, New Mexico, and Florida, as well as in Central Asia, Europe, and North Africa. The youngest known species of North American Amphicyon, called A. Ingens, was also the largest. This prehistoric monster is believed to have reached a maximum length of 2.5 meters, or 8 feet 2 inches, and a shoulder height of around 3 foot 11 inches and to have weighed anywhere between 200 to 550 kilograms, that's 440 to 1,212 pounds. It displayed a considerable degree of sexual dimorphism, which means that male A engines were considerably larger than their female counterparts. This bear dog had a heavy tail, robust legs, wolf-like teeth, and jaws powerful enough to crush bone. It is believed to have been plantigrade, meaning that it walked with its foot bones flat on the ground like a bear, rather than on its toes like a dog. Due to its supposed solitary hunting and scavenging habits, it is believed to have suffered from competition with pack predators like primitive wolves, which ultimately resulted in its extinction around six and a half million years ago. Is it possible that the Wahila that Frank Graves encountered in 1965, along with Tex Ziegler's Great White Wolf and the mysterious predator of Northern Ontario, was a remnant Amphicyon? whose prehistoric ancestors took sanctuary in the secluded wilderness of the subarctic. Graves maintained that the beast he saw had both dog-like and bear-like features. The Ontario hunter called his own creature peculiar-looking, and all three men described their monsters as solitary animals, significantly larger than the average wolf. All of these attributes appear to be consistent with Sanderson's theory that these large, lonely, white wolves of the North Country are bear dogs 
relics of the Northland's prehistoric past. It must be mentioned that many of those who have commented upon Ivan Satterson's Amphicyon theory have puzzled over his choice of title for the article in which he introduced it, namely The Dire Wolf. The Dire Wolf was a Pleistocene canine, only distantly related to members of the even more ancient Amphicyon genus. Officially classified as Canis Dirus, it is a larger, older cousin of the modern-day timber wolf and is believed to have died out around 10,000 years ago. Was Sanderson suggesting, by choosing that title, that the dire wolf was another potential candidate for the identity of the Wahila in addition to the bear dog? The answer to this question becomes clear when one considers the seemingly inappropriate title with the context of its usage throughout the piece. It seems that the father of cryptozoology employed the word dire wolf as a generic term for all prehistoric canines, much as he often used abominable snowman, a once popular name for the Himalayan yeti, as a blanket term for all wild men. In his online article entitled Witchy Wolves, Medicine Wolves, and the Wahila, published on February 16, 2011, Cryptozoologist Dr. Carl Schuker pointed out that the Wahila that Frank Graves encountered in 1965 bears striking resemblance to a new Mexican cryptid known to the Apache as the Medicine Wolf. According to cryptozoological investigator Nick Suchik, Schuker wrote, This is a very large all-white wolf with long shaggy fur, plus a very large chest, and a somewhat long snout and body, unquote. Local Apache Indians long maintained that this creature could only be seen by certain gifted people. One truck driver apparently endowed with such a gift saw a creature matching the description of the medicine wolf while driving down a road outside of Dulce, New Mexico, one evening in the summer of 1979. Lit by his truck's headlights, Shuka wrote, the animal came quickly out of some brush and paused briefly in the middle of the road before swiftly moving away and vanishing into the darkness on the other side. Another creature resembling the Medicine Wolf is said to have been seen by the former owners of what is known today as Skinwalker Ranch, a property located about two kilometers southeast of Ballard, Utah, where UFO sightings, cattle mutilations, poltergeist activity, and other unexplained phenomena have allegedly taken place for the past 50 years. The story goes that in the mid-1990s, while herding their first load of cattle into a corral located on the property, the ranch's new owners saw an enormous white wolf in a nearby pasture. The creature made its way across the field towards the family and, to their astonishment, approached them with its head down and its tail wagging, as if it were a beloved pet. It sidled up to the children and even allowed them to pet it. Suddenly, the creature lunged at one of the calves that was pressed up against the side of the corral and locked its jaws onto its snout, apparently attempting to pull it through the bars. The family's patriarch leapt into action and proceeded to beat the animal with a stick. The beating had no effect, and the wolf continued to cling to his calf tenaciously. The rancher then seized a 357 Magnum revolver from his truck and shot the wolf at point-blank range. The animal hardly seemed to notice. Astounded, the rancher shot the wolf a second time, whereupon it released the calf and looked at him quizzically. After firing two more bullets into the giant canine, which elicited neither blood nor the faintest flicker of distress, the man retrieved a hunting rifle from his truck and shot the beast a fifth time, blowing a chunk of hairy flesh from its shoulder. Incredibly, the wolf remained unfazed. After taking a sixth bullet, the creature appeared to recognize that it was unwanted. Seemingly no worse for wear, the giant white wolf turned tail and trotted off into the distance creating yet another bizarre parallel between the Nahani Valley and the American Southwest. According to Ivan Sanderson in The Dire Wolf, the Dene of the Mackenzie Mountains maintained that giant, white, wolfish Wahila were more common in the Arctic, and that most of them only traveled south into subarctic territory once a year. Intriguingly, the Inuit have their own legends of a solitary white lupine colossus which once inhabited the Arctic, which they called the Amarok. Is it possible that the legends of the Amarok and the Wahila derive from encounters with the same type of mysterious animal? In Tales and Traditions of the Eskimo, written by Danish geologist Dr. Heinrich Johannes Rink in 1875, the Amarok is described as a fabulous wolf of enormous size, bigger than a polar bear, yet not as large as an Agshik, another fabulous monster. The Amarok has more stamina than a bear, but lacks the ability to swim. It can hold an entire caribou in its jaws and still have enough room in its mouth to roar. In one traditional Inuit tale recounted in Rink's book, 
and Amarok took pity on an Inuit boy named Kagsagsuk and helped him attain special powers. Kagsagsuk was an orphan and a weakling, and was treated cruelly by everyone in his band. When he had taken more abuse than he could endure, quote, he ventured out among the mountains by himself, choosing solitary places, and meditating how to get strength. Once, standing between two high mountains, he cried out, Lord of strength, come forth. Lord of strength, come to me. To Kagsagsuk's surprise, an Amarok emerged. Terrified, the Inuit boy started to run for his life, but the Amarok caught him and twisted his tail around him. Using his tail, the Amarok squeezed a number of seal bones from Kagsagsuk's body. The giant wolf informed the bewildered Inuit that these bones had been stunting his growth. If it be thy wish to become strong and vigorous, the Amarok told him, thou mayst come every day to me. Kagsagsuk did as instructed and made daily visits to the Amarok. Every day he underwent the same procedure allowing the Amarok to squeeze some more seal bones from his body, and becoming a little stronger every day as a result. Kagsaksuk made an effort to conceal his new strength from his spiteful tribesmen, planning to shame them all once he reached his full potential. That winter, three polar bears were seen climbing an iceberg not far from the Inuit village. Seal hunting was out of the question at that time of year due to the frozen condition of the sea ice, and the hungry band was in sore need of fat and meat. In spite of this, none of the Inuit hunters dared to approach the three polar bears, members of the most powerful species in the Arctic, aside from monsters like the Amarok and the Agshik. Kegsaksuk decided to use this opportunity to reveal his newfound strength to his tormentors. Using nothing more than his mukluks and his gloved hands, he climbed the iceberg that the polar bears had ascended. When he reached the top, he wrestled with one of the bears and succeeded in slamming it so hard against the iceberg that it ripped in half. The band members, who had gathered at the foot of the iceberg to watch the spectacle unfold, gazed in astonishment as Kiksaksak picked up the remaining two polar bears one by one, hoisted them above his head, and hurled them off the iceberg to their deaths. From then on, Kiksaksak's fellow tribesmen treated him with deference and respect. The Nahani Valley is said to be home to a number of mysterious creatures. So far, we have explored the Nakani, which some believe to be a type of wild man similar to the Sasquatch, the Nukluk, which Lauren Coleman proposed might be a Neanderthal, and the Wahila, which Ivan Sanderson suspected might be a bear dog. All three of these cryptids, in the eyes of most cryptozoologists, are anachronisms hailing from bygone eras, living fossils like the coelacanth and the horseshoe crab, defying extinction in the last hidden corners of the globe. As it turns out, these three are not the only prehistoric monsters said to roam the Nahani Valley, living out their secret lives in the most wild, unexplored alcoves of the Northland. In fact, they are just the tip of the iceberg. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video and would like to help support this channel, please check out my book, Legends of the Nahani Valley, which you can find by clicking the link in the description.